Hi, everybody. This is Mike Oppenheim, and you are listening to Coffin Talk, interviews with the living, a weekly podcast that explores how our views on death affect the way we live our life. This week, we have a good personal friend of mine coming on the show. I just met him about a year ago, and he's in my writing group here locally in Phoenix. His name is Eric Thurston. He was actually raised in Indiana and then moved to Wyoming, where he worked on a cattle ranch. Then it started snowing in August, so he headed south, and he fell in love with Arizona. He then spent a year reading the classics and journaling, went to Arizona State University, which is local here, got married and had kids, and then he worked in the printing industry and then taught special education for 20 years before retiring. He also is a insanely creative writer, and he has some interesting ghost stories and stuff. So we're going to get into all that today. But before we do, let's just say hi. How's it going, Eric? Good, Mike. Uh, glad to, to be on with you. Awesome. And uh, my first question, as you know, because you've listened to some episodes, is um, how old are you? Uh, we kind of went over where you grew up and uh, what generation, if any, do you consider yourself a member of? Okay. Um, I'm 68 against all odds, considering <laughs> many, <laughs> many questionable life choices. Um uh, but um, and as you said, I, I grew up in Fort Wayne. I'm uh, definitely a baby boomer. Um, my dad was in World War II, so um, I was born in 1955. So um, oddly enough, nobody said, uh, okay, boomer to me, because <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not uh, a know-it-all like some of the people of my generation. So. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. So if you want to say that today then we'll get that out of the way you're already showing not telling why you're such a fun awesome friend of mine um guys i, I cannot express this enough there's gonna be a link to his web website perter bogel bogel i can't pronounce it bog elk uh and he has some of his writing and stuff up there he's insanely creative like seriously check out this man's stuff um so before we get into all the insane and creative things you do let's just get into the insane part of you um what the heck kind of person is from Indiana and moves to Wyoming and works on a cattle ranch? I would just love to hear that story. Okay. Well, um, I knew some guys that worked on the oil rigs out there. So I had these uh, delusions of grandeur that um, they were just making crazy amounts of money. So I went out there and um, it turned out that um, you work three weeks, 24 hours a day with five other guys out in the middle of nowhere and it just sounded like a nightmare. So haying was going on at the time. And um, so I drove a baler at the Cross Lazy 2 cattle, cattle ranch and then um, turned out that the uh, the haying stopped and the roundup started and I can't ride a horse to save my life. So <laughs> I really, uh, there was no, and then the snow hit in August. So that was enough for me. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I've been to Wyoming once. I spent the night in a tent, and halfway through the night, the um, this was in the middle of June, the uh, storm was so wild that I thought someone was beating the side of my tent with a, like, two-by-four and trying to kill me, so I grabbed my hatchet, and uh, I had drank some whiskey the night before, so I was definitely confused, <laughs> and uh, it was just a storm, and it was the worst storm ever, so I ended up packing up the tent in the middle of the night. It was cold and dark, really cold. And I had to sleep in my car with the engine running and the heater on. And it was June. So I'm like corroborating your story. Um, but it was one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. I drove through the whole state. It was, oh, it, yeah. It's incredible. The people are so interesting, too. They're uh, very, you know, individualist and um, yet very kind, oddly enough, on the other side. So a whole different species of people up there. Yeah, that's cool. I like because right now we're going in America through this like weird, awkward, maybe divorce thing and everyone has a different opinion on it. But the one thing I notice is people just keep forgetting to respect our differences. And that would be like a good example right there. Um, speaking of which, Indiana has a pretty like odd reputation and stuff. But are you from like the Indianapolis part or south or which where'd you grow up? Up north in uh, Fort Wayne, it's um, oddly, it's I always say it's this uh, the town that everybody's been through because it's on uh, one of the major highways, but nobody can remember anything about it. It's just your average um, Midwestern town, uh, light, light industries, and um, but yeah, the northern part, the very cold part. Okay, but it's not near Gary, is it? Uh, no, that's on the other side, on the west side of the state. Yes, I've been through there. That's I always thought of Gary like Mordor. <laughs> it looks like that from a distance. Gary has a sizzling sound you can hear over the music in your car when you drive through it from all the <laughs> electric like, plants and stuff. I think Gary's the oh, scariest yeah. place I've ever driven. Not scary in like, I thought I was going to get like, you know, 
held up or something. Just scary. Like, I, I can't believe humans have created this place. Yeah, so that's cool. So um, were you bored of the Midwest and also whatever we call Wyoming? And so, like, when you went down to Arizona, it was just, like, exciting? Or do you kind of, like, sometimes miss the Midwest? No, I actually, I don't. I haven't been back there in years, and I don't actually intend to go back. Um, no, it was an okay place to grow up, but I um, I wouldn't ever want to live there again. I just love Arizona. When I got here, um, it was September, it was warm, and I was sitting under a palm tree looking at the moon, and <laughs> I just <laughs> fell in love with the state. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I definitely have lived here six or seven years now, and it grows on me every single minute I'm here, and uh, it's definitely the most different place I've lived. I've lived in like nine or ten states, and it's just fantastically different. So um, I'm just going through your bio in order because I always wanted to ask you these questions, and I've been like holding them off in person. Um, so uh, you read the classics in your journal, and you went to ASU. What did you get your degree in at ASU? Actually, the um, the printing industry, oddly enough. Um, I, I started out in fine arts, and then I met my first wife, and realized I needed to be able to support a family. And so um, I was intending graphic design, but ended up in the more industrial side of the printing industry. And then I went back, um, got certified to teach after um, about 15 years in the printing industry. And what exactly like in the printing industry did you do? Like if, you know, if I walked in and saw you at work, what would you be doing? Um, just everything, quality control, worked on the presses, um, oh. did back in the um, olden times with the layout and paste up, the actually physically cutting and pasting things. Um, so, yeah, and um, worked on the <laughs> work, basically assembly line work, just um, it, they call it jogging books. You just stack the uh, magazines on a pallet and um, it some really grim <laughs> one of the worst jobs i've ever had. wow this is so fascinating i because you're <laughs> such a like happy and nice and funny person and you're very smart and it's not that i don't think the print industry has happy and smart people in it but i do think it's like a, a drag like as you just said like it's it's repetitive it's a lot of so it's interesting i made the mistake of the guys i was working with um I told them one day that, you know, this was so frustrating doing this because they could train an ape to do this. So from, from, from then on, we were not quite as good friends. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, and have you always been an artist or did that come on like later? Uh, you know, ever since I was a kid, I was able to, um, well, it's like wood carvings and using modeling clay drawings and, um, I always, I don't know where that came from. That's kind of the theme through the, the book too, that it's just like nobody in my family had any artistic interest or, um, talent. And then I just, it seemed to come out of nowhere. And, um, that, that's something that the main character has too. Okay. Yeah. Um, and by the way, everyone, he's talking about his book called Rick and Renee, which I, it's not done or out yet, but, um, it is amazing. And if you go to his website, you can see a little bit of it. Um, and then on your website, you do have that amazing uh, cartoon you made, right? Yeah, Lurch. Lurch. The mutant mallard, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone can read that. I think that is actually where I would lead people is just click on the button that says Lurch on his website and read it. It's yeah. It changed my life. So as you alluded to in one of your answers, I'm assuming that you are remarried, but you did have a first marriage, and that's when you had your children. Is that correct? Um, that's right. Yes, I was married for 22 years. Um, a wonderful, a wonderful woman. I, I have to say that. <laughs> yeah. No, I, it's, um, yeah, I, I've talked enough about what happened in my family history, so I will uh, save our audience oh, for more yeah. of that. But, um, I am curious, uh, how many children do you have? Uh, two boys that, um, well, they're not boys now, <laughs> um, and a granddaughter as well. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. Thanks. She's almost four wow. in December. She'll be four. <laughs> That's so cool. That must be so fun. Cause I have like, you know, as you know, a two year old and an eight year old and like, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm envious of my, of my parents and her um, and my wife's parents because you know, they pick her up, they play with her and then they hand her back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I uh, I really relate to her, and I think that's because we're at the same emotional level. So we <laughs> we 
have that in common. I can't talk about a novel that people don't have access to too much, but um, I am pressuring you to finish it and I have offered to help edit it and everything. So let's kind of get into a little bit more of the metaphysical side of you because this is a podcast about spirituality and metaphysicality and the lack thereof, depending on the person I'm interviewing. So I think my first question for you would be, do you currently observe any religion um, or how would you describe your outlook on spirituality in general? Um, I don't. Um, I do um, have a real uh, connection um, with Jesus, and but not through the church because it's pretty much ruined <laughs> um, any kind of message from the beautiful message from Jesus is pretty much ruined by religion. So um, in my opinion. Um, and I actually had an experience where I felt I contacted God when um, it was when I was reading the classics and I, I decided um, I got to a point where my life was just empty and I wanted it to end, basically wanted to just let go of my soul. And I felt the presence of God um, actually standing on my chest i could feel the weight of god and thinking that it would be <laughs> a presence of love and uh, it turned out god was basically saying you're you're lonely um you're isolated from the world uh you're a whiny little bitch was mm -hmm. what the message was so um that from that point i went out with an entirely different view of i that's when i enrolled in asu and just to be clear, not, I mean, I was to the point of, um, I couldn't go on. And I'm not saying that people that, um, you know, are like, because I haven't been through horrific trauma and things like that. So um, people have been through a lot more difficult things than I have. And, um, I, I, you know, I just want to I'm a whiny little bitch. I'm not saying everybody else. But <laughs> well, first of all, you're not. And and second of all, just real quick too, just really quick. Um, I think I understand what you're trying to say, but I also think that uh, I, I run into this a lot with people. Like there's no like trauma Olympics. And I don't think like people who suffer a certain type are worse or better off than other people. But I understand why you're phrasing it the way you are. And it's part of why I like you. You're a very humble and compassionate human. Very like to the nth degree. So what I'm more interested in is, are you saying that a lot of your empathy, warmth, and compassion was developed after that moment, or was it with you before that? I, I always felt that. I could um, I can definitely, uh, I'm probably overly sensitive, I can feel that from other people. So, But um, that kind of triggered going out into the world and, and, um, and trying to do better in the world. I thought a lot about how to phrase these questions and how to talk about it, because I think what you did for 20 years in special education is something that I've wanted to do, and it's going to be my next volunteer service. Um, I decided this a couple of years ago. So after my kids get to a certain age and I have more free time, I'm going to start volunteering in the same field, which is special education. So I'm curious, um, when you worked with special education students, was that like in itself traumatic? And I don't mean like for you, but just like witnessing and seeing how that is for families and different people, or was it like, uh, you know, just kind of talk about it. Oh, uh, definitely. Um, there were um, some stories that, um, uh, you know, I'd um, go to meetings and I'd go back to my room and I'd, uh, I'd have to just sit down and cry because of the, um, the trauma that um, some of those kids have been through. And and in addition, I uh, went to school in the '70s, and the the kind of uh, treatment that um, that special ed students got back then, and you know, being isolated and feared and um, made fun of, and it was really horrific to see. Which is one reason I got into. I felt like I could help make some changes. That's cool. And I have a very close friend and I don't think he listens to this, but I, I love him to death and I'm going to have him on as a guest. He actually already agreed. And uh, he worked um, at a, a center called the Ark in uh, Oregon in the same field. And uh, that was I had some influence through him and stuff. But, you know, he would always talk about just how difficult and weird it was to deal with like stereotypes and stuff. So I'm just curious, like, what is the best stereotype you could give to people who are mentally disabled and then what is like the worst stereotype that you hear that you wish people would not believe or buy into? Um, well, it's 
it's a whole range of disabilities mm -hmm. and they're the um they're people and they're kids and just like any other kids and they have um uh you know needs the same needs as other kids and they're they shouldn't be feared that um the the worst stereotypes is um, just lack of understanding. I mean, even I see that with teachers that um, not special education teachers, but others. I mean, there's a, a whole variety. There's um, Down syndrome and um, kids on the spectrum. And um, so there's a huge range. And just to try and pigeonhole, um, it's to like people with personalities trying to pigeonhole them. Well, it's like you read my mind because that was where I was headed is I've always been confused because when I was a kid, I grew up in the 80s. We used a very offensive word for all these people. We called them retards. And I'm saying that out loud on this podcast for a reason. It's because I want people to hear that, hear the way I said it. And I want it to resonate differently depending on how old you are. So you can understand just like how, in my opinion, awful our world has been as far as sensitivity goes. And, and to your point, the main problem I had with it, even as a child, is I, I didn't see a lot of similarities between someone with Down syndrome, for example, or someone with, you know, high autism. Um, we didn't even know the word Asperger's when I was growing up, and I don't even know if that counts as a disability. So that is kind of my next question. How would you say, as a sensitive, kind person who worked for 20 years in this field, we should go about with either not labeling at all or labeling? What is, like, the best way to not or to label? Boy, that's tough because... Um... Actually, all those terms like um, um, being retarded and uh, um, in this whole idiot, those were all scientific terms yeah. originally. Yeah, exactly. And then, of course, they became um, – and even like handicap, that's sitting out inside of a, a store with a, you know, a hat and yeah. <laughs> waiting for people to drop money into it. Uh, they, they just it keeps evolving with the terms like um, neurotypical and um, for someone on the spectrum and I, I guess it's just the nature of people are going to use um, when there's there's people that they feel are less than they'll use that as an insult I don't know um, what can be done about that um, but the terminology keeps changing, and I guess the, the, um, people will keep using, you know, updated insults, maybe. I, but I, I I'm more know. curious it's, about, like, the effect of labels. Like, if you – I don't even know if either of your children have a mental disability. I didn't ask, and it's not my business. But I, I'm curious, like, what would you want people to say? Like, let, let's use Down syndrome for an example because I have the most familiarity with that. Um the three people I knew somewhat well who had Down syndrome, obviously there's something that makes them different from like your average person. And yes, it's pretty like correlative, like both in features and, and behavior, but it, they didn't seem to care at all about a label for who they were like at all. They didn't, and they were smart enough to talk to you and like about things. So I'm curious, like, is there, is it a good idea? Like if a parent has a kid, is it a good idea to give a name to something that their child has things like that? Well, I, I think you have to be realistic too. You have to have high expectations, but you have to be. Um, it's it's to, my um, sons don't have disabilities, but those parents that do, that would um, you know, I've seen a lot of that. How difficult that is, but you do have to um, to get services and to find out strategies and. Um, there, I guess there does have to be, um, you have to be a realistic about um, the child to, I don't know if that answers No, it, it does, it does. And I, I'm so happy that you're willing to talk about this with me because it's something I really care about. And I want to, you know, we talked about the podcast briefly before you came on, but I like to have diverse guests and talk about diverse topics. And then I like to tie it into morality with the question that's coming up about dying. So this is like very relevant to me and I'm hoping it's helpful for our audience. And I just think it's something, you know, I think every parent considers it when they're pregnant or their spouse is pregnant, I, I would think. And, uh, you know, a lot of these things don't even come out or you don't realize it until the child's much older. So I just think it's always a relevant conversation. And I do think like the history of like how different cultures have dealt with it. Some of them horribly others better, but, um, I was curious to just kind of get a, 
you are an expert, literally. I mean, you're a professional and an expert, so I wanted your expert and professional opinion, and I believe you gave it to us. So I will just, this will close up this part of our conversation. Is there anything you do want our general audience to know about this subject? Hey, everyone. If you're a fan of the show, please head over to MikeyOp.com and click the subscribe button. It's the best way to support us, and it's free. That's M-I-K-E-Y-O-P-P dot com. Thanks. Um, just, just compassion and understanding and uh, not making judgments about um, uh, about people with disabilities and just some empathy. Um, yeah. It's, um, I don't know, you kind of kind of caught me off guard. It's a very emotional issue <laughs> with me too. Well, we can hear it in your voice and that's, you know, the beauty of a podcast, I think. So um, why does it make you emotional? Let me ask you that. Um, I, I think um, I... Growing up in the the seventies and seeing um, the um, students with uh, special needs, um, they were completely. I they were literally in a trailer behind the power plant, and the only time you'd see them is they'd come walking through to the cafeteria like a chain gang, and everybody was, um, you know, they didn't understand them. They weren't part of the school. They were completely separate and. Um, then, of course, because of that, I saw a horrific beating just because, you know, a, a student was, um, I wrote a poem about it, actually, but um, because a student was, um, had, he was down, had Down syndrome, and um, that was his crime. Oh, <laughs> so they beat him. And just, uh, this should not make you feel better, but just to give perspective, I grew up, like I said, in the 80s, so like a decade later than you, and uh they were doing the same thing at my school. And I remember very vividly like asking a teacher, like, why are they separate? And then one day they brought them into like an assembly to watch it with us. And people were like staring. And I just, I remember it vividly. And I remember, uh, I remember it like the way all my childhood memories are just confused and bewildered. Like that's what every single childhood memory of mine has no, like, and then I thought this, it's more that I was just staring at this world and trying to figure it out. And I still am. I'm, 42 and I'm still just staring at this world and trying to figure it out. So, uh, but let's, yeah. <laughs> let's get back to you. Um, so you talked about your relationship to God and Jesus specifically, and then to religion. So I am curious, uh, in your mind and in your heart, what do you think is going to happen when you die? Um, I really believe in, um, in an in infinite number of universes. I believe that we exist. Um, I was reading something the other day, if you imagine something, it creates a universe. And um, I think our consciousness is here in this one. So when we die, it, the sadness will be that we're gone, other people will miss us. But I think we, our consciousness will be in one of the other universes then. And I'm hoping for the, the I'll go into the one where I'm, um, I've got art in the Louvre, and I'm married to Shakira. So. <laughs> I, I would like to mention that your wife asked if she could listen to this podcast live, and that that comment would probably not have made her happy. Um, yeah, <laughs> I was very nervous about her listening in, but she's going to hear it eventually anyway. There's no way I'm cutting it. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> uh -oh. um, actually, it did remind me of one of my favorite shows on Earth is Curb Your Enthusiasm with Larry David, and there's an episode where his wife wants them to renew their vows and she writes a new vow for them to say. And, and it's, I can't wait to spend eternity with you. And he says, I, I never agreed to that. What? <laughs> he's like, I'm not going to say this. I agree till death do us part. <laughs> and it becomes yeah. like this huge fight. Um, so yeah, you kind of reminded me of that. Um, all right. But uh, that was a, a beautiful answer and I liked it. And I do agree. Um, I actually, the more I think about imagination and universes being creative and the more created and the more we get into AI and just how like, you know, I mean, I've like made films before and you get like into your own characters and you're making this film and you're basically just making a new reality. And then I also am a victim of watching too much TV as a kid and then believing that those were like real memories and like real events. What you said, like really struck a strong chord of resonance with me. So I do want to hear real quick because you had this awesome ghost story from a park. Um, can you tell it to our audience? Uh, yeah, it's actually um, on a, a website, ghostvillage.com. And you just go to uh, search for Paiute Park, P-A-I-U-T-E. Um, I was with my son, and um, three. I saw three ghosts at a playground. Um, I go into 
uh, detail, and I even made a little map <laughs> of it. But um, they were ghosts. I, I hadn't uh, believed in ghosts. I didn't believe in ghosts before that. I wasn't looking for ghosts, uh, but I um, had the experience of seeing um, a, an old lady dressed in rags, a middle-aged lady, and a little girl, and they disappeared. <laughs> so uh, there's more to it, but if uh, anyone wants to visit that. What it, what in particular made you believe in ghosts? Because a lot of people are afraid to even admit that even if they do think it. So you're here on a podcast with an infinite audience, meaning at any point, any person could just decide to download and listen to it. So how would you air quotes defend that allegation that there are ghosts? Because I saw them because um, it, they were there and um, some very strange things happened. Um, time kind of stopped. Um, the little girls on the playground were doing this chant kind of um, thing. And when I looked over, when time started up again, everything started to move. And I looked over, they were gone. And um, there was no place for them to go because I looked around. There was a it was next to one of those uh, power plants, a huge wall with the razor wire on top. And um, I looked all around. They had just disappeared. I mean, that's phenomenally creepy. And I, I no one gets to like, see my guests because I purposely don't do video podcasts. I just don't like it. And I think it's more natural to talk on a phone. Um, that's just me maybe being old, OK, boomer. And I'm not even a boomer. But my point is <laughs> um, you're a very normal person and you're a very like – intelligent person i've said that a lot of times on this podcast so i believe you and i think the people who want to believe you will and the people who don't who cares but i am curious like how much did that shake your foundation in like i understand what's going on like like how did it change you for the rest of your life because it it obviously did um well it didn't um i didn't feel any fear or terror or anything like that um it was just another weird experience <laughs> and um so, uh, I mean, life is pretty strange anyway, so I just um, added that to the list of we weird experiences, I guess. That's cool. And and you said you were with your son, right? One of your sons? Yeah, Paul, uh, my older son. He, I think he was about um, four at the time, but um, he didn't see them. And I, I'm kind of glad he didn't. That's what that, that's the part of the story that actually piqued my interest is like perhaps you had a profound moment just like the time – God was pressing on your stomach, on your chest. Um, maybe this is like another intervention from the universe to compel you to be more you. I mean, does that make any sense? Uh, yeah, that's, and I um, talked to someone who really uh, believes that she was actually a psychic. And um, she said, I, I was there witnessing them leaving um, this world. They got together because they appeared at different times and they got together and that was, um, I had, it was kind of an honor to be able to, to see them leave um, where, a world where they had had a pretty rough time. Yeah. Wow. Well, I love that story. It gave me goosebumps. I read the whole thing. So, I mean, I know like the full version and you're a great writer. So I do agree with you that people should head over to ghostvillage.com and search uh, for your story. And I'll try to make a note for that too in the podcast. Um so with all that said, um, I've asked you a lot of the questions I wanted to ask, not all of them, but I never, ever get to all my questions. So I would love to give you the floor. Is there anything you'd like to say to our audience before we let you go? Um, just I wrote this down. Just be kind out there because there's already too many assholes. So <laughs> when you're out in the world, just be kind. And also, if you're hurting to, to get help, there's nothing wrong with that. Wow. No, that's great. Um, Eric, I really appreciate you. I appreciate uh, knowing you. You have such a warmth. I just can't relate enough how much your presence, because you're actually a quiet person in person, which is shocking because you should talk a lot more because you're so funny. But um, <laughs> you really do. You just have this incredible presence. And uh, I don't know if it's been with you your whole life, but it was instantly noticeable. And uh, we don't get to see each other as often as I'd like. So I just wanted to say that to you on the phone right now. Yeah, and before we go, I just wanted to thank you for uh, the writers group and um, your kindness and compassion to um, to all the writers in there. Because not only that, you're you're so encouraging to everyone. Yet your your critiques are good too. That um, you know when things need to be said, you say them. And I I don't always do that because I don't want to hurt people's feelings. So, but. Um, 
but um, yeah, you, it's the best. I've been to a lot of writers groups and the best one ever. Thank you so much, Eric. This has been another uh, fantastic episode for me. I am getting so much joy from doing these podcasts and I never saw it coming. So um, this is episode 160 something and you've been a fantastic guest and to everyone listening at home, the best way to support the show is to please go to MikeyOp.com and sign up for the weekly essays and please consider a premium subscription. It uh, really helps us and it also helps my confidence. So if you have it in you, go for it. And if you don't, no worries. I still love you. This is Mike Oppenheim. You have been listening to Coffin Talk and we will see you soon.